Welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe, an interview-based podcast featuring conversations at the convergence of politics, environment and mental health in a world on edge. My name is Ben Habib and I'm an international relations scholar, an environmentalist, permaculture practitioner and neurodivergent coffee drinker. Join me in my quest to explore the edges that define us, divide us, and shape how we interact with each other as we grapple with the extraordinary changes taking place across our world. Order a hot beverage and get comfortable. This is the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Greetings, Edge Dwellers. I'm really excited to be introducing Dr. Beck Flower, lecturer and autism researcher in the Department of Psychology and Counseling at La Trobe University. Beck and I recently collaborated in co-delivering a couple of lectures in the lecture series for the undergraduate subject, Understanding and Support for Autism at La Trobe University. This discussion builds on themes that we explored in those lectures. And a shout out to any Sci 3 ASD students that are listening to this episode. In our chat today, Beck and I explore the social model of disability and how we apply this to understanding the lives of autistic people, in contrast to the medical or deficit model of disability that so often dehumanises and disempowers people on the spectrum. We discuss the barriers to the diagnostic process for adults and some of the issues that arise post-diagnosis. We examine some of the challenges that arise for neurodiverse students at university and explore some strategies for students who are navigating that journey. And we end with a fascinating dive into the role of music and movement in emotional self-regulation. A quick note on terminology and background. Through our discussion, we switch a lot between talking about autism, ADHD, and neurodiversity more generally. So to clarify, when we use the terms neurodiverse or neurodivergent, We're generally exploring areas of overlap and common experience between autism and ADHD. Please do get in touch if you've got feedback on how we approach this. We're obviously not the final word on anything, and we're happy to take feedback on how we represent our concepts and how we represent our respective peer communities. Before I begin this chat with Beck, a reminder that you can support the production of this podcast by smashing the like or subscribe buttons on whatever platform you're listening. You can make a one-off contribution of any amount via PayPal, or you can become an Edge Dwellers Cafe subscriber on Patreon with access to bonus material and a monthly live session online with me. See the show notes for details. Also, a quick apology for the occasional click in the interview audio in this episode. Under lockdown conditions, I'm captive to the functionality of the technology, and on the day of this interview, our internet connection was a bit glitchy. Nonetheless, this conversation was a lot of fun, and I think you'll like it too. So let's get to it, my conversation with Beck Flower. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. Beck Flower, welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Thanks for having me, Ben. Really looking forward to chatting today. Yeah, this is going to be a a very interesting discussion on autism and ADHD and neurodiversity. Obviously, this is a a topic for my own personal reasons and my own journey that I've been uh, diving into and exploring in great depth over the last couple of years. And I've been really fortunate to have been asked to be a guest lecturer in the, the third year psychology subject. Understanding and support for autisms. Yeah, I really should know that. But being be able to contribute my life experience to the story or to the lecture series there and to engage with psychology students who I don't usually get to engage with, who are going to be the new professionals, the next generation of clinicians and uh, and people in the mental health system. So that's been a real privilege. And to, to meet you and to get to work with you. And you've been a really big influence on my thinking in the in the short time that we've been able to work together. So this conversation is going to be fantastic to kind of flesh out where you're coming from and talk about your research and to dive into some of the issues that come up for neurodivergent people in and outside of the university context. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And yeah, it's been great um, chatting to you about the subject we're working on. And like you said, it's a really great subject to 
yeah, be able just to talk to people about our lived experience who will be, like you said, the future professionals working in all different fields. You know, some of them will be psychologists and some will be helping professionals in allied health fields. To start off, how did you end up becoming an autism researcher? What led you into this professional space? Wow, oh, great question. So, and I'll try to, uh, my, my specialty is going on tangents, <laughs> so I'll try to keep it relatively efficient. So I will start with school, though, <laughs> because that's really where my love of psychology in general began. Um, so I really, I really disliked school. I, I didn't like going to school. I wanted to leave high school. Uh, I had an agreement with my parents that I could leave high school when I turned 15. And when I turned 15, I said, all right, I'm, I'm ready to go. And they said, no, no, we changed our mind. You've got to stay. And I, I really struggled at school. And, and looking back at it now, of course, I've had a recent uh, two years ago, I was diagnosed with ADHD. So it makes sense that I struggled to sit all day in a noisy environment with lots of other people being distracted, listening to subject content that I wasn't really interested in. But I did get the chance to study psychology in years 11 and 12, and I really enjoyed it. And that really sparked a passion for me. I, interestingly, I was advised against studying psychology at uni. Um, I received a pretty high mark for my year 12. I, I did, couldn't listen in school, but I studied in the evenings to make up for it and uh, worked hard, got a great mark. And the mark for entry for studying psychology isn't always so high. And so I was um, advised to go for something different, but I'm so glad that I didn't listen to that advice. And I did go with my interest, which was psychology. Really loved uni, loved learning about all the different facets of behaviour and psychology, but in particular really enjoyed learning about autism. So I did uh, my undergrad at La Trobe. Uh, a lot of the people I work with now actually are lecturers that I, I learned from in my undergraduate years. Following my fourth year honours when I really developed a love for research. So I wanted to be a, a psychologist until the fourth year where we get to learn a lot more about research and I learned that it's all about problem solving and investigating things and, uh, and thinking all the time. And that works so well for my brain when I'm interested in something. And so I started to learn about research. Uh, following my fourth year, got a job in research in organisational psychology as a research assistant. Had the chance to talk to a bunch of other people with psych degrees about what they were doing and the different higher degrees they were following and decided to do a PhD and was still really interested in learning more about autism. Uh, so I ended up completing a PhD at Flinders Uni with uh, professors Robin Young and Neil Brewer, who were great to work with. And uh, my primary supervisor, Robin Young, uh, had a, has a psychology clinic in Adelaide and had a real passion at the time for working with autistic adults. And so that's how I started working with and conducting research alongside autistic adults. And although my PhD wasn't specific to employment, which is my real area of passion now, equity of access to employment for uh, autistic people, through meeting um, so many adults on the spectrum during my PhD, the main thing that came up was employment. People were telling me they wanted a job, they couldn't get a job. They had a job, they were struggling in their work. And it really bothered me that they were these people who were just really um, willing and able to work and I could would make wonderful employees but just couldn't get a job or were getting a job working and just not being valued, respected, not being paid enough. And so following my PhD, I applied for a job at, at Specialist in a uh, not-for-profit helping companies learn about autism and hire autistic adults as their research and innovation manager and helped them um, make sure their practices were evidence-informed. And that was great, but I started thinking a lot more about how I could potentially have a larger impact in going back to academic research because it was so great working with companies and, and doing that really practical work that sometimes we don't get to do in academia when we're conducting research. But I, I found this middle ground where I can still conduct academic research looking at these issues and share that with a broader audience in the hope of more change work alongside autistic researchers, autistic autism researchers, which is super important. We need more autistic autism researchers, learn more about and start to conduct participatory research or co-design co of research, co-production of research with autistic people, and then still partner with and work alongside industry to share what I'm learning in research as well. So I think I've struck a nice balance there. Uh, and then also, I guess, use that research knowledge to help teach students who will then hopefully be our future professionals and employers. So that's how I've kind of come to where I am today, uh, working as a, a lecturer in the Department of Psychology and Counselling at La Trobe and having a yeah my research focus on uh, really around equity of access to employment for autistic adults. But I'm also becoming, I'm really interested in equity of access to other things too. So 
uh, accessing mental health, people's awareness of autism and, and practitioners' uh, awareness of autism as well. And I guess because I've got this diagnosis of ADHD in the past couple of years, starting to really broaden my interest to ADHD as well and other areas of neurodiversity. One of the things that stands out really clearly in what you've just said is the need for co-creation and incorporating autistic people in the research that's done about autistic people, which from the research that I've done into this, into the history of autism research, it's not always been the case. It's been a lot of research about autism and about autistic people from people looking in from the outside and not really mm-hmm. understanding the lived experience. So how do you incorporate this lived experience into your research? Great question. And I'm still, um, I would suggest, early in my learning journey, um, coming at it from a few different angles, I suppose. So for me, I so I work alongside uh, autistic researchers and colleagues who are on the autism spectrum and conduct research with people, you know, academically trained who are autistic autism researchers. I try to inco- like work alongside community members as well. So in my current research projects, that's still really in the early stages. I'm I'm learning about how to do more and trying to do more. So things like I recently uh, worked on a, or led a, a grant funded externally grant funded project where we had a group of advisors from the community who made up the different stakeholder groups we were interested in in learning from. And so we worked with some autistic adults. We worked with some parents of autistic adults, uh, talking about their experiences working with disability employment service providers. And so in some other projects, we will work with autistic adults when conducting qualitative research studies to help us make sure that the questions we're asking are appropriate in interviews. I've got a student at the moment who's working with an autistic adult uh, to go through kind of the project and how we've analysed data and if our interpretations as non-autistic people about the data provided or, you know, shared with us by our autistic participants is accurate. If we've, you know, maybe our lens as non-autistic people might be biased, chances are it is. Optimally, though, it wouldn't be these little bits and bobs. It would be partnering with autistic community members right from the start of a project, from developing a project. And um, I'm still learning as an early career researcher how to go about doing that. I know there's a focus on it at La Trobe and I'm part of a working group there. And I also supervise students who are autistic and otherwise neurodivergent as well uh, and and talk very openly to students about, about research and the need for this. But, yeah, I guess... I knew that and I've been part of some training programs. So the Autism CRC conducts a a training program to help facilitate co-production between non-autistic autism researchers and autistic researchers, which I think is awesome. But then also with this newer diagnosis of ADHD for myself, I appreciated how important it was. But I think that I, I just think I have a better understanding of why it's so important too. I should have always. But when I look back at, at ADHD research that's been conducted clearly by people with ADHD, the deficit-based language is it's just so hard to read. And it's so, it, and, and some of the stuff that I've been reading of, it just doesn't even seem to make sense to me. It's where intervention research has been conducted and it's a pre-post scale of, of ADHD symptoms. And I think, is that something that you can change? Is that something that you'd want to change? Why is that the primary thing that's looked at? And it doesn't seem like it's person-centred or centred around the needs of the person with ADHD. So I guess in a long-winded way, what I'm trying to say is that I think that, you know, working alongside the autism community to in deciding what research projects to conduct, uh, so I do try to also do that. I try to look at uh, autistic advocates and look at what they're calling out for in terms of where to focus my research. Um, Working alongside people from community who aren't, say, traditionally trained in academia uh, in conducting research working at training autistic autism researchers to be academics and working alongside uh, academics that are already, you know, trained in academic research. I guess they're the four kind of areas that I'm working on in trying to immerse myself more and learn more about working alongside the autistic community in conducting research. But I still am just so early in that journey and I just think it's so important and it's just been such a big shift for me in the way I see research and I think just having an ADHD diagnosis helped helped me with that shift a little bit more so than perhaps I I was there but I, it's moving faster now because I'm I also realize I'm neurodivergent so yeah after my diagnosis I had a chat with our colleague Beth Rudalski and one of the books that she recommended me to to come up to speed on this was Steve Silberman's Neurotribes and just looking at the history 
the evolution of the understanding of autism from the early 20th century and a lot of the problematic ways that it was framed as a disease or from that deficit model, there was eugenics mm -hmm. thinking uh, that shaped some of these views. Mm -hmm. It's really horrific the way that autistic people mm -hmm. were treated. And so understanding mm -hmm. that history to, to where we are now with a social model of understanding autism, that's been a really big shift. And that's interesting to me because I think if I'd been diagnosed when I was a teenager, say, for example, so 20, 25 years ago, the clinical landscape that I would have done so in would have been radically different. And I would have had a much different and probably worse understanding of myself as an autistic person had I been diagnosed at that time. And I, I would probably be in a much worse space. That's a really interesting way to put it. I was asked the same, a similar question recently by someone who asked me if I thought I would be doing better now if I'd been diagnosed at a younger age. And it's, it's so hard to know, but I think you make a great point that there has been a huge shift in the way that autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions have been viewed over time. I still think, though, I think being working within a university system, um, working alongside, you know, learning from the most current research means that I still have a bit of a... I'm not sure of the right term, but, you know, I, I still think that sometimes I'm in a bit of a bubble and I think that things are better than what they are and more progressive than they are because I know who to follow in the self-advocate space. I, you know, I, I'm aware of the autistic autism research is doing this great work and some of the recent research I've been conducting with Rachel Jellett that we haven't yet published but are, are working on has been talking to autistic adults about their experiences working with psychologists. Um, so some autistic adults have been talking to about getting adulthood diagnoses and their experience with that and some uh, about their experience just working with psychologists and what psychologists could be doing to better meet the needs of, of autistic clients who are seeking, you know, mental health support. And some of the data we've got just doesn't align so much with that progressive view of things are changing, unfortunately. Some of it certainly does and there's there's certainly much more information out there. There's certainly a changing view, but it's a lot, it's changing a lot slower than what we need it to be. And that deficit-based view of autism and the other neurodevelopmental conditions, you know, I guess that are normally put under the neurodiversity umbrella like ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, uh, et cetera. It makes it, it, it makes a huge difference that, you know, uh, I think sometimes uh, researchers trained in that traditional way think, oh, you know, it's it's just language. It's not a huge it's not a huge deal, but when you're that person with that experience, it is a huge deal. That when you're a person in the world who thinks and feels and acts differently, and and there's a, a stigmatized, stereotyped view out in the media and in the research that's incorrect and negative, it has a huge impact. And so I think that's why I'm I'm particularly passionate about about the stuff you're talking about right now, about the, the work that Beth Radulski is doing. She's doing some awesome work, changing awareness in this space really using some cool tools too. Beth has a great TikTok um, that's a really great educational piece for learning about uh, autism and neurodiversity and does some great advocacy work. Yeah, I'm going to have Beth on here later on in the year and we're going to talk about all that stuff and, and the TikTok as well because that's really taken off in a, a rapid space of time. What's the advantage of the social model in analysing autism? Great question. So, yeah, the social model, I guess the social model of disability um, within which the neurodiversity movement really sits, which is this movement for equity for autistic people, for uh, other neurodivergent people, it really looks at how people individually can still have challenges, but many of those challenges are really due to the environment not being accommodating for the person rather than the person having a problem that needs to be fixed recognising that the person has a difference that might be different to non-autistic people, but that it's not something to be changed. The environment, however, should be changed or can be changed to better suit the individual, and that might remove the challenge that they're experiencing. So I love the social model of disability, and I guess thinking about how it applies to things like the challenges I see in employment would be instead of expecting that, so if we think about employment and the job application process, it's a process built around rapport building. It's a, it's a social process. It's a, a, a really a non-scientific process. Research doesn't really support job interviews as a, as a good way of finding the, the most appropriate person for the job. And so instead of thinking, 
okay, we need to create a social skills training or a, a job skills training program for autistic people to be better at job interviews. I think, and the social model would suggest, it's more about actually let's look at changing the job application process so that it doesn't require someone changing essentially who they are naturally to get the job, particularly when it's not a good way of assessing applicants anyway. So things that can be changed are things like making the job application process clear, removing jargon from the process, um, making it really simple. Often they're so complex and they include so much jargon. And when you're a literal thinker who might have, perhaps because of barriers to employment, might have a patchy job history, might not meet some of the criteria uh, and think that that stops you from applying. But often employers don't mind if you don't meet all the criteria unless they're essential, as long as you can sell yourself as being, you know, having potential to do the job then that can make it a lot easier for people who are autistic or otherwise neurodivergent to apply for the job. So also things like um, changes that can be made from the employer's perspective are things like asking someone to show an example of their ability to do the job rather than just getting them to sell themselves verbally on being able to do that job. And so that's an example of how the environment and what's around the person could be changing to better meet that person's needs rather than thinking with the medical model, thinking that person has a deficit that needs to be fixed. Yeah, the, the political scientist in me, you know, is looking at social systems at the moment and institutions and think there's so much wrong. <laughs> and with how the economy is structured, this is so hostile to people generally. And it throws up so many additional barriers for mm -hmm. neurodivergent people uh, that don't need to be there. So there's good, in a way, I feel like neurodivergent people and people with autism are canaries in the coal mine that if we have a strong reaction to something that's hostile in the environment, the chances are it's hostile for everyone, but we have a greater sensitivity to it. And that there's a wisdom in listening to the experiences of us. Yes. It's so interesting you say that. Going on a, a slight tangent, but talking about sensitivity, I was thinking about in, you know, coming to our, our coffee cafe chat today about uh, my strengths and the strengths of people with ADHD. And so one of them is sensitivity. And I think it's probably, I think that we don't know enough about this among neurodivergent people, but whenever I, I meet other neurodivergent people, uh, ADHD or not, there's this commonality, there's these common threads that I don't think are really being researched because often research looks at these conditions in isolation and thinking about sensitivity. When I was young, maybe around three years old, my parents had to stop watching the TV, watching the news on TV, because I was I would cry at all the things happening in the world and how bad they were. Um, I'm I'm vegan. I've always had this big um, sensitivity for animals, and and just I've always been told that I'm I'm too sensitive. I just feel things so deeply, and it can be so overwhelming and so hard to explain to other people. But when I explain it to neurodivergent people, they usually understand. But neurotypical or people who aren't kind of uh, aligning with those conditions considered under the neurodiversity umbrella don't tend to get it as much. Um, but I read this piece, uh, this book uh, called Untamed by Glennon Doyle, and Glennon talks about her daughter being super sensitive and sensitivity like a superpower, almost like you said, canary in the coal mine, and that instead of thinking about it as a bad thing, you know, the opposite of sensitivity is insensitivity. And we certainly don't need more insensitivity in the world. We really need more sensitivity and I agree with you. I think that that sensitivity that it seems that neurodivergent people share is just so important. And, you know, I think we sometimes have a good sense of connections and how things fit together in society too. And, you know, this is an unscientific opinion, but it just aligns with exactly what you were saying. So thanks for sparking that thought in me because, yeah, it's something I've been thinking a lot about. I guess since my diagnosis, I've been reframing the way I think about my personality and my characteristics as an individual. And one of those I really struggled with was sensitivity. It was always something that I was kind of shamed for. Um, but now I've started to really see it as a strength. And so I agree with you. I think that the viewpoints of neurodivergent people could be listened to and sensitivity is one of those things where we could come in super handy in, in the world. Yeah, that really resonates with me. Hyper-empathic. Hyper-empathy yeah. with it. Yeah, is that a thing for me, and that's growing up as a male in a country town. That is not a trait that is good for one's survival, so to speak. And that was something that I I buried, but that comes at a great cost at the time and, and later on in your life. That's something that you have to. That's an adaptation and a mask that you have to unlearn uh, in order to be a whole person. Yeah, and but it, you're right. It's such yeah. a strength. And especially for males, you shouldn't have to bury that. 
No, absolutely not. And I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I'm also from a country town, so I that whole um, sensitivity and vulnerability as weakness thing really bothers me. And um, you might enjoy, I, I, I quite enjoy um, Brene Brown's work who speaks a lot about the research behind vulnerability and vulnerability is a real strength. So, yeah, this is great, Ben. Thanks for touching on these things. It's, um, it's always so interesting to me how when uh, neurodivergent people come together and talk, we just have these shared experiences that I'm still really learning about, um, you know, um, I've been through this, this, I guess, so have you probably, you know, we're both relatively recently diagnosed, we're both uh, learning, I feel like I'm learning on a daily basis more about what it means to, to have ADHD, I think that I, I probably also meet some other neurodivergent condition um, diagnostic labels that I haven't yet had the chance to have evaluated, like probably dyspraxia and maybe some others, but yeah, there seems to be this, yeah, just common common experiences, common feelings, common thoughts. Yeah, me too. I know we've had this discussion previously that, you know, I've also, I'm pretty sure I've got other diagnostic labels that apply to me as well. And it is, it's a daily learning process. Of course, we understand and we know our lived experience of our whole lives, but the way that we the way that we understand and conceptualize that experience has changed in such a radical way through diagnosis. It's real ontological shift of how we interpret and understand really how we relate is. to everyone and everything around us. It, it's quite profound. Yeah, it's a really interesting process post-diagnosis of um, all these different stages of, you know, I rejected the diagnostic label initially really interestingly, even though I sought it out and even though I so clearly meet criteria for ADHD and now embrace it so much and um, try to help people learn more about it. But then I uh, was excited and angry that, you know, why did no one know? There's all these risks that come with ADHD. It's, it's some of the challenges are so treatable or such easy strategies. There's so many risks around impulsivity and, and just some undiagnosed ADHD just feels like a moral failure. Um, and you just feel so negative about yourself and shame yourself so much about so many things, probably very similar with all the neurodivergent conditions, really. And so this is anger of why was this not picked up? Why don't people know more about this? And now it's a, it's looking back and going, oh, I'm not so much angry anymore. Occasionally I am, but now it's more self-compassion, self-understanding and, and just feeling like a, a light bulb goes off every time I have a memory of something I did or a way I behave and think, oh, that makes so much sense. Now I understand why I did that. Now I understand why I do that. And if there's a challenge now, I can, I'm, I'm feel so privileged to have the diagnosis to then be able to, uh, you know, come up with some strategies, learn from what others are doing, read the academic literature. We're so fortunate to have access to that kind of knowledge, you know, and information and, and kind of just test and trial out different strategies to see if they work for me. So, yeah, long-winded way of saying, totally agree with you. It's a different lens. <laughs> it's a different way of seeing the world and seeing yourself as a person and, and how you fit within the context of the world. And, and I think, though, majorly having some self-compassion. You raise an interesting point, and this came up in your previous yeah. remarks as well. Sure. About being, universities being in a bubble, because we have access to the best information in the world from the world experts on literally every topic. And mm -hmm. that stuff is... One, it's paywalled in mm -hmm. peer-reviewed publications that you really need an institutional subscription to be able to access. Mm. And two, it also, that material is really dense conceptually, so you really do need a level of education to be able to interpret that information. Mm. So what's available for the public is radically different. And there's a space for charlatans and snake salesmen uh, that you know wouldn't pass mustard in the academic informational realm, but in the public informational realm, it's wild west. It's a different space, and we see this problem, you know, across the board of different issues. It, you know, it's an issue with our COVID response, with climate change. You, know, you name it, this informational gap is an issue. Is, is that something you can speak to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I can speak to it with regard to uh, autism diagnosis, just with regard to some recent research I've been doing just this year, still ongoing. But the data we have, um, we spoke to some autistic women about uh, getting a, a late diagnosis, an adulthood diagnosis of autism. And one of the things that came up was people thinking they might be on the autism spectrum looking for, you know, verified information, like you said, academic-based information, verified information from, from experts and, and not being able to see an alignment between themselves and that information. 
But then when they would learn from people with lived experience of autism, they would immediately see that they fit within that group and could identify as autistic. And so that seems to be a real problem. I feel the same way about ADHD when I, I just speak from my own experience, not so much the academic literature, but well, I feel privileged that I, I could access the academic literature. There's not that much of it around adulthood and ADHD. Um, it's it's starting to grow. Uh, autism's more progressive. It still has a long way to go, but there's a real focus on adulthood research and autism at the moment, which is so awesome. ADHD is following, I would say, I don't know, in my mind, five to 10 years behind that and the other neurodevelopmental conditions behind those. But I, I couldn't find much information. And, and even the, you know, the diagnostic criteria for a reason is, is deficit-based. I suppose you need to be able to show challenges in order to meet criteria to receive support. But it's hard. It, it doesn't, to me, capture the nuances of the daily experience. And nothing I read, you know, it, it really took a long time for me to piece together information from verified sources to determine whether or not I met, I thought I met criteria for ADHD. And it really wasn't until I learned from advocates, ADHD advocates who have ADHD themselves. So there's a couple of experts out there who are researchers and practitioners who have ADHD and they're super useful. And that's why I think we, you know, we need more autistic experts on autism, you know, practitioners, psychologists, uh, researchers. But there was a lot of just people, you know, like uh, Danny Donovan creates some great cartoons about ADHD and Danny has ADHD. Uh, Jessica McCabe has a how-to ADHD YouTube channel. And just watching watching Jessica's videos and looking at Danny's cartoons, everything just fell into place and that just helped make that link for me. And without that, I'm not sure I would have felt comfortable making my case to my GP for why I wanted a referral for ADHD. So I think what you're saying is a real problem. In research, a way that I'm trying to address that, so I guess it's really research translation is the problem. It's access to the information and it's translation or communication, communication, I suppose, also of the information to the community. I think we need to do more of it. I think it's a real problem. I recently, in a project I conducted or led, um, created some tip sheets and they were a good resource for sharing. But I've been thinking a lot about that, a lot about with academic research that I'm a part of, how can I better share the information rather than just publish it in academic journals, which is important, but only goes to a particular group of people. And often that's not the people who need the information. Yeah, and hence the rationale for Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast is to share the work that I do and, and the people in my orbit uh, with a wider audience because that's so important. And it's so cool that you're doing it, Ben. I, I you know, I, I have all these great ideas like, oh, I should do a TikTok and then I don't do it. I should do a podcast and I don't do it. And so, you know, you and you doing this podcast is great. That's why TikTok is great. You are um, following through with these brilliant ideas so that you can share information with people who are interested in it and looking for it is awesome. Yeah, well, it takes to work. And yeah. the fact that we have to do this highlights the problem with the, the regular way of doing things and, and mm. with institutional processes that they're not friendly. Mm. Uh, I want to talk more about this diagnostic process. Now, I'm obviously coming at it from an adult, someone at midlife who's been in the mental health system for a long time, done loads of self-exploration. So the way I came to this and how I figured it out and led to diagnosis it's going to be different for other people i think every every person's journey will be unique to this but what are some of the barriers to access that there are for getting a diagnosis and the, the difficulties that there are in finding a clinician that can do it sure i feel like i can probably speak more to adhd than autism if that's if that's all right still really looking at our data on um, on barriers to diagnosis for adults on the spectrum. I guess uh, for ADHD, just speaking from my own experience and from what I know of others, and I haven't seen much academic literature in this space, but I would have looked for it at the time that I, that I was seeking diagnosis. Um, it's really hard. There's barely any information on where to go and what to do. So I, um, I guess, like I mentioned before, I just scoured everything, every bit of information I could find from uh, websites. There's not much formal information that I could find, but fortunately, I suppose as someone working in research, I have access to the, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, as part of that name is. It's the Diagnostic Manual used in Australia uh, to guide the diagnosis. I have access to the academic literature, and so I would read up on, you know, what, what do adults with ADHD talk about as their experience, and does that align with me? And I just wrote a list of symptoms. I wrote out the DSM criteria, and I wrote out I spent a long time writing out how I thought I might meet them and, and just thinking through 
day to day, which is actually really important because one of the challenges that people with ADHD have is um, executive functioning challenges. So likely to have an IQ, skewed IQ profile. So working memory, uh, processing speed, not maybe at the same level as our other abilities, like um, verbal comprehension and perceptual reasoning. So I'm likely to, given the diagnostic process is all about really sitting and talking in ADHD, at least with an, a practitioner with expertise in the field, I'm likely to forget everything <laughs> the minute I'm, I'm likely to be nervous and anxious and feeling, uh, am I, do I have the right to be here? So writing it down was important for me. Um, I took it to a GP who, who uh, I've moved a lot, so I, I don't have a you know a strong relationship with any GP. I've lived in lots of different towns and cities over the past ten or so years. So this GP knew me after a few visits. Um, they did refer me on, but they referred me on to someone that they knew. So uh, to my knowledge, adulthood ADHD needs to be diagnosed by a psychiatrist in Australia. And my GP referred me to a psychiatrist who turns out had no expertise in ADHD, but they knew that practitioner. So that I had a meeting, a very expensive long meeting with the psychiatrist who didn't really ask me questions about ADHD, said that my document, which I didn't realise the GP had passed on actually, it was more for me to talk to it, wasn't written for someone else to read without context, said that it was pretty much useless and then said to me, well, you've got a job and a PhD, so what's the problem? And asked me what tool I would use to diagnose ADHD in myself. I'm no expert in ADHD. I think maybe because I had a PhD and I was an autism researcher, maybe that practitioner thought that I would know or could guide them. And they said, well, I can't really diagnose you and ask me a few questions actually that related more to autism than they did to ADHD. And I just walked out feeling crap. I felt like it was a waste of money and time. I guess the thing about these neurodevelopmental conditions is they're really just, they're just human behaviours. It's just the challenges are to a different extent than other people because of neurobiological reasons, but we can't see those reasons. And no one's going to do a brain scan just to double check if you meet criteria. Their condition is diagnosed based on presentation and adulthood, that's discussion. And it's it might include other things, you know, screening tools and, and more formal tools and checking with other people, et cetera. But it's, it requires you to be able to verbalise what's going on for you in a way that meets the criteria, in a way that's nuanced enough and a practitioner who's willing to listen to you. And when they don't, and it's very common from what I understand for, among adults on the autism spectrum and with ADHD to, um, to feel this way, to feel rejected, to feel um, invalidated, to have practitioners reject their initial um, suggestion or request for assessment. So I did... I felt like maybe I didn't have ADHD and it was just still excuses that I was making up for poor behaviour, you know, running late, having trouble staying on task. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just crap. And so then I just kept going back again to the, all the information. And I think that's, again, where those self-advocates, the ADHD advocates with ADHD, who put out information and it made me just feel validated, like, oh, other people are experiencing these challenges. Maybe it's not just me being a crap person trying to look for an excuse for my behaviour and my challenges. And so for me, it was then I had to do a lot of research myself, look up, ask around, look up practitioners who had expertise. I ended up calling a, a clinic and saying, does this practitioner have expertise with adults? Do they have expertise with women? Have they recently diagnosed women with ADHD? Are they comfortable with that? Do they have a number of clients with ADHD to make sure I was going to see someone? And um, in my even in my initial um, assessment, and when she gave me the assessment, she essentially said to me that I was such an obvious case of ADHD, that it was so, it was just so different, someone who had expertise and knew about the condition to someone who didn't. And I think that that's a real risk when you're already spending your life masking, uh, trying to fit in with others, realising you're different, but wondering if it's just because you're a personal failure more so than neurobiological reasons we need to make that process easier. So, yeah, I understand that's a similar process for from the literature for autistic adults too. It's this initial uh, lack of awareness by those primary medical practitioners, uh, lack of experts. Cost is a barrier. So, yeah, sorry, I mentioned I was only going to talk to ADHD, but, yeah, these, these all do align for ADHD and autism too. It's expensive. There's not many people who do it. You need to be able to be really persistent and push through um, any lack of awareness that's out there too. That so mirrors my experience, almost word for word. You've, wow. you've got a PhD, you've been successful. What are you worried about? I think you've got anxiety. Here's some SSRI medication. Wow. Yeah. It's no, and, I, I felt awful after that. Yeah. It, and that's the thing, though, too, is that we are likely to have anxiety. We are likely to have depression and other conditions. And 
Yeah, I was listening to a podcast recently with Dr. Russell Barkley, who's an ADHD expert, talking about how, yeah, often, and I'm sure this is the case with autism as well, these other conditions are diagnosed. And, and the primary neurodevelopmental condition is overlooked and missed. And that's a real problem because these other things won't go away without really understanding the person and understanding that they have ADHD or that they are on the autism spectrum. Yeah, well, my opening line uh, in my first diagnostic se session was, I have anxiety and I've suffered periodic bouts of depression for my whole adult life. I want to know why. <laughs> so if at the end of this session, the finding wow. is you have anxiety, it's like, are you fucking serious? But he did tell me that I that I was on the spectrum. It's like, okay, yeah, you validated what I'd already figured out. Yeah, it's it's interesting right. you say that you actually went, yeah, for it's like to understand who you were. And I did the same. I went to a psychologist and I said, I am I can't relax. I'm busy all the time. I'm really anxious you know, is it just anxiety or like, why am I, why did I, I worked three jobs when I was in year 12. I worked full-time while I studied full-time. I had like 10 casual jobs and different things, lots within the university, but some external and in different departments and schools during my PhD, which was full-time and finished on time. I just, and I always thought it was survival. I always thought I just have to pay the rent. I've got to, I don't live, you know, I don't live at, with my parents. I've got to pay the rent. I've got to look after everything once I finished my PhD, it'll be fine. And then I finished, I thought, why can't I just do a nine to five and relax at night? Why can't I chill out? And I didn't have external pressure saying I had to, and I couldn't work out why. And that practitioner was awesome, but they couldn't, they didn't know much about itching. They couldn't help me with that. And we we talked about all this other stuff, but it essentially came down to anxiety. <laughs> and, and, and that is a big part of autism and ADHD, but it, it wasn't recognition of ADHD that is what I actually needed. And so that's why we need practitioner awareness, right? So that then we could have, been told yeah anxiety but also hey your developmental condition and here's how we get assessed and here's what that means and here's what you can do to better understand yourself and gosh wouldn't that be great <laughs> yeah every time I tell my diagnosis story to peers it's like I get nods this, this happened to to me too yeah it's so common um it's that so and I guess that's why you know we we appreciate that the um the landscape has changed people understand it a bit more but clearly not enough because we're all having these experiences of of being denied a diagnosis or being invalidated and it can take you know, just so many years I think I don't know what it, so for me it was about six or seven years from when I first thought I might have ADHD or when I got a diagnosis what about you Ben? It was reasonably quick it was like within six months. Oh that's but, good. But after 15 to 20 years of really solid self-exploration so okay so not really a six-month period no, more no, of, not at all. I, I know i'm different what why am i different for a long period of time the edge dwellers cafe yeah yeah and my very public incident having, having the nationally televised panic attack on on abc tv and that really put me in a space of having to come out about having anxiety. Mm. Which you and flipped into such a positive, in such a positive way in the end. Yeah, the accidental hero being yeah. thrust into a position of leadership on that. But that my story resonated so much, particularly with a lot of students. And this this is probably a good segue to talk about the challenges of neurodiversity for students at, at university. But mm. What are some of the challenges that our students are facing uh, as neurodivergent in the university space? Sure. Oh, where do I start? I suppose just to think about, it makes it a bit easier for me to think about sometimes when I relate things to my own experience, which I, I've heard from talking to other people with ADHD, it's, it's quite common. Unfortunately, it comes across as quite egocentric because we relate things back to us all the time. But I, what I, I don't mean to be egocentric. I mean to just, uh, I mean to do it in a way to say, oh, I understand what you mean. That happened to me and it helps me understand the process things. So I guess I'll start with the things I struggle with as a student with ADHD and I think then talk to some of the things I'm learning that our uh, neurodivergent students have. So things like, you know, paying attention. I find it hard to explain and I think that over time, we're expected to pay attention for less periods of, you know, shorter periods of time anyway. And that's why things like TikTok can be so successful because it's it's short, rapid information. But really sitting and focusing on a two-hour lecture is so hard. I um 
I would have loved online learning when I was a student. Actually, there was at the time recorded lectures and we could listen to them on, say, I think, you know, I don't know, a mini disc or whatever I was listening to at the time, probably a, a discman or something. <laughs> Maybe a uh, maybe an iPod if I was yeah for maybe an iPod by then um, and so I could walk the dog and listen I would bake a cake and listen to a lecture I would actually double or three times the speed of the lecture too so I could actually pay attention to it whereas sitting in a lecture face to face which I guess we don't have the luxury of in these in this time at the moment with COVID but that there's some benefits to that absolutely and some students really love it but students like myself who have ADHD really struggle to sit and pay attention for that long so I would. I would eat to stay awake and I was, even if I was really interested, I would eat, I would type. I'm one person who looks distracted and like I'm not listening, but I'm actually listening. So when I look most distracted, it's probably when I'm paying most attention because I need to move my body to regulate my attention. So I actually, that is a, a struggle I'm guessing a lot of our neurodivergent students have. And I try to let students know in, say, face-to-face -face tutorial that stinning is okay. Um, so, you know, self, self-stimulatory. You know, you and I know what stimming is, self-stimulatory behaviour. Like I've got a rock that I'm playing with at the moment. I play with my pen. I kind of let students know this is what stimming is. This is my you might want to do it. You're welcome to do it in class. Um, you're welcome to get up and walk out and leave if you need a break. You don't need to explain yourself to me. I think just being forced to sit is a real problem. And I'm guessing that's why I had so much of a problem at school. What are the other challenges? Um, deadlines and prioritising things can be a real problem. I think that sometimes we've got some great tools and strategies within universities. And I know Latrobe has a really great accessibility department um, and team who will work with students but sometimes I found, at least as a neurodivergent student, um, finding information is really hard. I think that sometimes we think things are really clear, but they're not at all. They're so hard. So navigating big chunks of information can be so hard. I know that I process things in, in pictures and figures better. I'm not sure of uh, any academic research around this. There might be. I'm just not aware of it. But I do try to put figures and pictures to, in things that I present so that hopefully, you know, I try to present information in a few different ways so that it's hopefully someone will at least get one of those things. There's some key things that we can do in universities and in workplaces that actually benefit everyone, you're divergent or not, that really help new division people. So clarity is one of them. So, yeah, clear, simple information, transparency, providing information in advance. When will classes be? Where are the lecture slides found? When will meetings be held? Is there an agenda? Provide that information well in advance. Don't do a pop-up meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m., you know, and what's the meeting about? Where do I need to go? Who's going to be there? What do I need to do? Being aware of sensory sensitivities. I guess when we're all working from home, that's not so much a problem, but it can be, you know, if people have uh, backgrounds with movement, that can be really distracting and hard to pay attention or sound in backgrounds and lecture theatres. So we're often uh, asked to learn in, in spaces with heaps of external noise and that can be really hard to pay attention to. And I guess in an online learning environment, things like a lot of people have a lot of anxiety as well. So not expecting people to turn cameras on and just allowing having subtitles for lectures and things like that too for people with, uh, who are neurodivergent often have auditory processing challenges. So they're just a couple of things off the top of my head that I've rambled off. I'm sure there's a lot more, but they're the key things I'm aware of. I, I do try to ask students, I, I say, these are the things I'm doing to be more inclusive and accessible based on what I know can be challenges, but please let me know if there are th other things I can do. And I've had good feedback about things like not forcing cameras, um, about having subtitles on PowerPoint slides, about talking about stimming and be open, just modelling some things as well, being open and not ashamed that I stim, you know. Yeah, I've started doing that. I've got a little squishy globe of the world ball that I use to stim while I'm giving lectures and standing up in front of the class now. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that, and very open at, at encouraging students to do what you need to do to feel comfortable in terms of yeah. stimming. Yeah. I think that's a key thing, right? We... I think that often um, neurodivergent people feel the need to mask who we are and mask our needs, mask what we need to pay attention because we're, you know, I guess for me I'm embarrassed. I'm in an academic job that involves sitting all day and working in deep thought and a stereotyped view of ADHD would be, well, she can't pay attention what she's doing in the job. So I, I worry that if I, I stim or I'm moving too much, people think, oh, yeah, there's the bouncy ADHD are. When in reality, it's it's not so much like that. Sure, stimming helps me pay attention and I, I do regulate my, um, do need to regulate my energy. I do actually have a trampoline in my house, a little bouncy one that helps me self-regulate emotion and, and dopamine and how I'm doing and feeling. 
so I do have that hyperactivity and energy, but I can absolutely still sit through meetings and go engage in that deep thought. And I guess it's the same for students. I think that, yeah, it's just ways, in in my opinion, it, there's a, really just being open, understanding, listening to their needs and making them feel comfortable, particularly if they're um, first and family students. I was a first and family student. If they're regional, where you know, you and I both grew up in regional places, we already might feel a bit out of place at a, a uni with lots of other students. So just the stuff that's really going to help everyone, I think. Are there other things that you do as well that I've that I've missed? Well, I've started doing the the subtitles on PowerPoint since I saw you do it because I didn't know how to do it. And then I figured it out after, after seeing you do it in our joint lecture. So that's a, a good innovation. But I, I make a lot of pre-recorded videos for lectures now and I host them on my YouTube page, which automatically generates subtitles for them uh, and allows the students to play them faster or to stop and, and go back. So I, I really like hosting yes. uh, the content on YouTube for those reasons. That's a great idea. I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, how we can make learning more neurodivergent friendly or less taxing cognitively. And I, I would love to set up something like a TikTok where it's like, I think that short bursts of information to music can actually be super helpful. I just haven't had the time or I don't really have the inclination to video myself doing those things. But I think that something like that for key information, just really short, sharp videos, short, sharp pictures and images could be maybe more helpful for some people than a, a long subject learning guide where we provide all the detailed information in written text. Yeah, I would love to learn. I'm still re- very early in my academic journey. I only started a teaching research job last year. So I'm still thinking and learning and doing a lot of reading about what I could be doing better and just asking students and learning from them because they're the experts in, in their experiences and what we could be doing. Right. One of the issues that's close to my heart as well is navigating the bureaucracy of the university. So this is a large, authoritarian, vertically stratified university. It's really difficult to navigate. I've worked there. I've worked in the university sector for almost 20 years, and I hate the bureaucracy so much. It's not just that it's annoying. Like I have a really physical, emotional reaction to having to navigate it. And I know for students who are less experienced with this, it must be a nightmare. I think you're right. I don't know. I I don't think about it so much, but I think that I do think about processes. And I think as a first family regional student who I just had no idea what university was. So I agree with you. I didn't feel like learning about what university was and what all the systems were or are. Is that approachable? I think once you're in the system, it's hard to see how the system appears to other people and how it can be more approachable because once we get used to systems, just as humans, we tend to think that other people will understand what we understand. It's like, it's hard to know what other people don't know. I often say to students too, you know, I, if I'm not being clear, that's on me, not you. So please let me know if I can clarify something because I might think I made something super clear. And I think the same goes with, with processes like in the university, you know, how to apply for courses, how to apply for subjects, how to find information on that. I guess my approach is that, yeah, I find it all complex. I guess I just always assumed that I found it complex because it was me, not so much the system, and that maybe other people thought it was easy. So I guess I just take the approach of um, letting students know that this is how processes happen. I guess I have a tendency to think everything's big and scary, and so I try to just be open and honest to students about how things aren't that big and scary, and, and this is what they look like, and this is what the process is and how to follow it. But, yeah, there's definitely in all kind of big organisations yeah, processes that are hard. I guess I'm saying I agree. I acknowledge that things are hard, but I think that I didn't always think that everyone else thought they were. I think I probably just blamed myself a bit of and thought it was me that thought it was a lot harder than everyone else. Yeah, I can relate to that too. <laughs> I often have students, because I'm out and proud uh, as neurodivergent, often have students coming up to me who have got a fresh diagnosis or they're neurodiverse and, you know, they're struggling with the uni environment and they want help because they're treading water, still young and figuring themselves out and are in an environment where that can be really challenging. What kind of advice have you got uh, for our neurodiverse students in terms of treading that water? Wow, that's such a big question, but such a good question. So what advice do I have for neurodivergent students? Well, I guess... There's so many students who don't know that they're neurodivergent but are just thinking I might be. So first of all, in any situation, have self-compassion. I guess even in this discussion, we've already shown that sometimes 
systems and things go wrong, but we tend to blame ourselves. That's very common for neurodivergent people. Um, we tend to think we're having a struggle and it's something to do with us and not something to do with the system, but often it's not about us um, and not we're not the only ones having that struggle. So, yeah, maybe one, have self-compassion. I think that's the number one thing I've learned since I got diagnosed. Two, use it as an opportunity to explore who you are and what works best for you. It's up to you if you want to follow that pathway to diagnosis. Recognise that if you do, there might be some barriers along the way and that doesn't mean that you don't meet criteria for those diagnoses because lots of practitioners just don't know much about the adulthood presentation um, and what it's like. So validate your own challenges, um, have that self-compassion and use it as a really cool opportunity to go, maybe I do think differently to other people and that's okay. And actually there's some really great strengths with being neurodivergent. There's absolutely some challenges, but if we think about that social model, those challenges are often due to our needs not being met, not so much about ourselves. So think about ways that you can have your needs met externally. Think about ways that you can have strategies, to like so think about accommodations others can make for you or that you can ask for. Think about strategies that you can make that might help you and, and seek those formal supports too. So um, if you're in a uni, if you're, say, at Latrobe, there's the accessibility team, super friendly staff that will help you think about things that can make life easier for you. And I think that's probably it. Yeah, so seek formal and absolutely seek formal support for your mental health too because often when we're questioning like whether we're or not we're neurodivergent, it might, it's it's often at uni because we're having challenges, right? And like you said, when students are having challenges. So have that self-compassion and try not to blame yourself. Use it as an opportunity for learning. Seek formal support whether or not that's diagnosis, diagnosis or not, but like reach out to people who can help and who have training. So there's, you know, counselling teams that are free that universities provide. Our, our wellbeing um, team absolutely offer that and other universities do the same. Um, reach out to psychologists or psychiatrists, whoever you need to see, and try not to self-stigmatise, uh, self-shame, and just think about what your needs are. Because I mentioned earlier that I, um, I hope you don't mind me adding to this one, this answer, man. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, rejected the label of ADHD initially which was after initially accepting it then I rejected it and that was really interesting looking back and I think it's because like I really didn't know much about ADHD until I started exploring it I had stigma about ADHD I had um and then I think I felt shame um I felt oh no what does this label mean for me what will other people think of me and then a couple of friends said a couple of things one spoke to me about medication and I didn't realize I would be biased against medication I guess thinking about psychology and um, we often think about, you know, cognitive behavioural therapy and things that can be done that don't involve medication, but medication alongside other strategies can, and therapies can be super effective for people with ADHD like myself. And she said, well, if it's just like, think about it like putting on glasses, you wouldn't deny someone glasses if they had a problem with their eyes, challenges with seeing, would you? I thought, good point. And another said, instead of saying, oh, you don't look like someone with ADHD, which I get. And I don't know if you get that about autism too, Ben. But I got, um, instead of that or, oh, that's weird, I got a friend who said to me, wow, what a really great opportunity to learn about yourself and your needs as a person. And I just hadn't conceptualised it that way. And ever since, I think, what a great response. And it really is. It's just this, you know, you spoke about Ben. Years, of, you know, you spend so many years trying to understand who you are, and I do the same. I constantly do that now. I've always done that, probably because we know we're a bit different to lots of other people we're around. And then I thought, oh wow, that really does gel with my need and my thirst for knowledge. This is such a good opportunity to to look at how I can be more effective, happier, healthier, um, more balanced in this world. And um, yeah, so they're the four things <laughs> that I think I would suggest. But I agree. Um, and there's so many neurodivergent students. Yeah. And so many, I guess, an increase in diagnosis too, as we get more awareness of these um, the neurodiversities. So, Beck, what are some uh, work strategies that are useful in a, in a workplace context? So things that I do in the workplace that really help me, I guess the number one thing that really helps me in understanding myself that I, I actually, I love this trick. So um, I mentioned before the How to ADHD YouTube channel with Jessica McCabe I find super useful. There's a video that I watched ages ago where Jessica talks about ADHD brains needing four things to pay attention or one of four things, but more than one is, is a good thing. And this aligns with what I understand from the academic literature about people with ADHD have an interest-based nervous system, which is really hard to explain, but it's just so much easier to pay attention to things if I have one or more of a, I'm interested personally in something. So drag queens, great. You know, psychology, great. Uh, autism and employment, awesome. B, I'm challenged. So 
I need to feel like there's a challenge. If things are too easy, they can be very boring for me. C, learning something new. I just have this thirst for knowledge. I always have. I hope that I always will. It's often unpredictable, but it, I just love learning. Uh, and D, there's a deadline. It has to be an external deadline. It can't be a deadline I set. When I set it, I don't stick to it. If other people set it, if you set me with a deadline, I'll stick to it most of the time. I'll try to. <laughs> so if I have so interested, challenged, uh, learning something new and or there's a deadline, I can pay attention. For me, academia fits all of those. So there's always deadlines. There's lots of things to be interested in. There's lots of different things we can be doing. There's so many challenges and there's always new things to learn and think about. And actually, academia is a really good job, I think, for people with ADHD because there's always new things to be thinking about and learning and our brain is constantly thinking about different just teaching strategies, ways we can be inclusive, research projects, etc. So my trick is that if I've got to, you know, we all have to do lots of tasks and things at school or uni or work that we don't want to do or that we find really hard, I look at those four things and think, how can I at least meet one of them? So I had to do something recently. I it didn't meet any of those. There was a deadline, but often that's not enough, particularly to the big task. That just makes it worse and makes me procrastinate more. So I um I try to make myself interested in it. So I know I become more interested in things when I can see the practical outcome or if I can see how it will change something, how it will impact something, how there's a real world reason for doing something. I'm not very good with theoretical. I'm very good with practical stuff. I think that's why I need to be researching things with a practical impact. I'm not very good with better understanding of the concept or anything or theory really. So I tried to, (laughs) my my poor um, husband, Dan, I said to him, can I just talk to you about this stuff? And (laughs) I don't really even need you to talk back that much. I just need to, I need to talk stuff out to you. And I tried to think, well, if I do this, then it might help this. And if I do this, then it might make a difference here. And I often just need to verbalize things. So he really cops that a lot. But I, I've learned now that I do that to him. And I'll say, do you have the, you know, the mental capacity for me to be just blurting all this stuff out to you now? Because it's going to help me focus my thoughts. It's going to help me make myself interested in something. I will sometimes go and learn about that thing in another format. So maybe it's just that I'm learning from a paper and I find that reading the paper really hard. But maybe if I watch a YouTube video on the same topic, I'll be able to come back to the paper or a podcast or a picture or social media. Ways to try to make myself interested and learn more about the context around the subject helps. You can make it something more challenging for yourself by gamifying it. And same with deadlines. You can say, oh, how quickly can I unload the dishwasher in two minutes? Or, you know, I or I distract myself by listening to a podcast while then cleaning or something because cleaning is boring but listening to podcast is interesting and my brain will focus on that not the cleaning so then I've listened to the podcast I'm like oh wow my house is clean how did that happen I don't even remember doing it (laughs) so that's a good trick headphones so I uh, listeners can't see me but I'm wearing these lovely noise cancelling headphones which are my life I um, put them on when I'm working so that I can hear people through in meetings better hopefully people can hear me better so that I'm not distracted by people around me, whether that's on or off campus. I put them on sometimes when I'm cooking. I hate cooking, so it will distract me from thinking about cooking or distract me from the, all the noises in my house. It just really helps me focus and do things. It can boost my mood, so I can use it to listen to all that great music while I'm working um, without making heaps of noise with everyone else around me. I find movement super useful, really bad at doing it. ADHD, um, people with ADHD are often uh, consistently inconsistent. Consistency is so boring to me. <laughs> Routine is so boring. I, I know I need to do it. I'll benefit from it. I'm not going to do it. I really struggle. But I can be persistent. So maybe there's a few different things that I know are good for my body and movement. What, you know, I might, I've got a, trampol- a little mini trampoline I just got. So useful and fun way to just regulate my um, my body, my mood, my emotion, and also get a bit of exercise, listen to some music. Um, it's got some little uh, pulley things that help with your muscle. I forgot what they're called, like, resistance things um I've got like an exercise bike I might listen to a podcast I need to be like listening to a song or a podcast and moving on the bike and looking at eBay or something on my phone at the same time to possibly focus on riding an indoor exercise bike when I'm going nowhere whereas if I ride a bike outside I can at least focus on all the pretty birds and just hope that I don't fall on my face which I have done before just before a job interview and had a big cut or like a massive gash on my face that was really hard. Um, uh, so movement, headphones, music, and yeah, just kind of self-hacking those four things. And then my other things for, I guess, like office work, 
time perception is really bad for me. So I, I'm way too optimistic. I like to think about it as time optimism. I'm really optimistic about time. And it's so interesting. I even I was saying to a colleague a couple of nights ago, I had this book to read. It's an academic type book, but it's, you know, a textbook, not a huge textbook, maybe a small by textbook standards. I looked at it and thought, I'm going to read this tonight, the whole thing. And I know that's not feasible. I know I'm not going to do it. But in my mind, I'm like, of course I can, as I'm definitely going to read the whole thing tonight. And so it's so interesting that logically I know that I'm absolutely not going to read the whole textbook in one night, but my ADHD time perception is like, yes, you are, of course you can. And I think it's like a challenge accepted thing. So when it's challenge accepted, it becomes a challenge and it becomes, actually gets me motivated. So to deal with my time optimism, I do block out and colour code my whole email calendar so I put meetings in there and I used to just have meetings in there, but then I couldn't put t- I couldn't see the time I needed to work on tasks. So I, by the theme of my job or, you know, research, teaching, service meetings, I have all of it colour-coded. I put deadlines in green so that they're not scary. And I back t- fill the time with all the time I need to get to that deadline. And that is something I live by. And I, and I always have paper notebooks in front of me. Low tech options are good for organizational strategies for ADHD because if it's high tech, I'm likely to not have the battery for my phone, not have the charger, lose something. Uh, so I need to be able to have a pen and paper in front of me. But pen and paper and calendar are the key things for like an office job that I found useful in addition to music. But these are like my top tips. And, and also having a, I need to be comfortable in my space. So I need, it needs to be visually appealing to me, which sounds really silly but there's something about feeling comfortable in a space that makes it conducive to working. Uh, It could just be that I'm not going to get distracted by it, but I need to feel like it has a positive vibe about it, which I'm sure is completely unscientific. But there's something about the space that I need to feel like I feel comfortable in it and I can sit and then I can focus. So, yeah, I think that I think about these all the time and these are the few things that have really stuck with me and it's just super useful. So if anyone's listening and, and not sure how to get work done. Hopefully those will give you some ideas anyway that might work for you. Yeah, some really great advice there, Beck. Thanks so much. Uh, this is something that comes up for me in my role so often. This will be a great resource, actually, this discussion to be able to share uh, with students in those situations. But I want to finish off now with a, a discussion that I've been hanging out to have with you for ages around neurodivergence and music. Cool, yes. And we've kind of sort of nodded knowingly at each other whenever I've brought this up, but we haven't had the space to talk it through. But I want to frame this around an article that I came across recently called How Heavy Music Saved Me from My ADHD. Uh, I just stumbled across it on Facebook somewhere, but it very much spoke to me. It was The author was talking about how heavy metal music helped them regulate their emotions, particularly when they were young mm-hmm. and still figuring themselves out. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I really relate to that. Like, I can't do minimal music, slow music that's not meaty. I need it. My sound's layered, immense, and often fast uh, in anything from, you know, electronic music to metal, some hip-hop, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and always have, and, and I always will. And so I thought there's clearly there's something to this. There's some kind of mm. neurological reason why this music not just speaks to me but has a profound impact on my mood and well-being. Mm. yeah you're you're so right it's I'm I, I guess I'm kind of at a loss for words which is very unusual for me uh even though I knew you were going to bring this up because what you've said is exactly the same for me and I just didn't know this was a thing I didn't realize this was a, a common uh thing that neurodivergent people had but I agree I um I think I wasn't diagnosed when I was younger because I danced I did professionally when I was younger like between say 10 and 20 so a lot of music a lot of movement um so exercise helps regulate ADHD uh, focus but I I just got into the music so much I I used to do yoga and you have to there's so much time for thinking and I just always thought wouldn't it be so great if there was like ADHD yoga and yoga with like different themes so that you could go like a heavy metal yoga because that's when I could actually focus on the self-care and the deep breathing if my brain was stimulated enough by the, the music but the music for me has to be so I agree total it helps me with my focus helps me with my emotions profound impact on my mood and how I'm doing that day and can completely change my mood but it has to be music that I'm not always familiar with but it like has to suit my mood I get really stressed if there's music playing that I'm not in control of and I can't change and it doesn't suit my needs do you find that at all yeah very much so and it's not like 
I just don't like this music. Like this is having the opposite effect on me. This is bringing me down and making me yeah. feel really Yeah, yeah, me too. Really uncomfortable. So yeah, do you? I have like a Spotify playlist. I have one for when I need to write, and so I've got it's called music for thinking work. I've got a work playlist for when I just my brain needs a bit more stimulation to get tasks done, and it would just keep. It's almost like, and I know it's completely unscientific, but I describe it as the front of my brain needs to be doing the work, and my back of my brain needs to keep occupied and busy and out of my way with the distractions by just listening to music that I'm familiar with, comfortable with. Keeps my dope, you know, keeps my, uh, dope, you know, I guess dopamine, norepinephrine up enough to get the task done. But I've also got like a playlist for motivation and feel good and particular music that I listen to when I'm exercising to give me a boost. Yeah, huge. I have to pay, I have to play music when I'm driving to like that I'm familiar with to help me focus on driving. And I get completely lost in the music, but at the same time, I can focus sharply while listening to the music. Is that any similar at all for you? Yeah, yeah. So when I'm doing work, because I like binaural beats, uh, so really layered uh, sort of meditative stuff for when I have to concentrate Ooh. and do brain work. Yeah. But then outside of that, like I've got hard music playlists, one of which I've got on YouTube and I share all the time. <gasps> I, I must having, listen. Yeah, I'll, put a, I'll share it with you and I'll put a link up on the show notes for this episode too. But it's like cool. oh, I always feel like I'm going an, an order of magnitude more complex my brain's operating at an order of magnitude greater complexity than what my mouth can process <laughs> what i can describe to the the outside world and mm-hmm. i feel like my brain's running at a speed that's faster than the world around me so yeah. when i put in like if i put on drum and bass or side trance uh, or some grindcore or thrash metal it's like that equalizes the external environment to where i'm at internally and then i feel in equilibrium that is such a good way of putting it. I agree with you. I often feel like my brain feels much too fast for writing and speaking and just getting things out. And so, yeah, maybe that's what it does for me too because it, yeah, that's a really nice way of describing it. I hadn't thought about it like that. But, uh, see, I used to um, I used to work at a nightclub and that was great because it's heavy music. You could feel the beat in your body. And I would, I would study in my breaks in the nightclub and people would wonder how I could possibly do that. But I found it so helpful to be feeling the, the music and hearing it and studying it was like perfect study opportunity for me. It's so odd to other people. But, oh, yeah, the way you've described it really resonates with me. It just gets me thinking about solving the world's problems too sometimes when I listen to music and my brain just goes on this exploration of opportunity and and problem solving and great things I could be doing. And uh, sometimes they don't always occur. I know in ADHD we're very great idea solution generators and don't always have the dopamine and norepinephrine regulation to then put that into action or there's way too many of them to action but um yeah music when i discovered the rave scene in my early 20s also coming with that was dancing yes and being able to get completely immersed in the music and dancing and you know looking back that was a really good embodied physical therapy that Mm -hmm. got me feeling into my body and accessing you know, the body as a, as a repository of knowledge or mm-hmm. a repository of information about yourself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And so I know like dance therapies are a big thing now, but I discovered it by accident through the rave oh, scene. Yeah, anyway. I didn't know about that, but it totally makes sense to me. Um, and, yeah, for me it would have been working in nightclubs and moving. I worked in hospitality for 10 years and I danced for 10 years. So I was constantly moving with music in a work or hobby situation and, I actually got diagnosed when I stopped doing all of that, when I was no longer moving regularly, um, when I was just doing a nine to five office gig. And that that's when I realized all my ADHD challenges, or that's when I guess they became exacerbated. So that totally, that notion totally resonates with me. And I look forward to doing a bunch of reading on this now after this yeah. chat, because yeah, there must be lots on that. And if there's not, there should be, because yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's, it's, it's exciting in a way. Um, you know, when I don't know about you, but like when something goes wrong, it's great to just chuck on a playlist or a song and it can change me and my mood immediately. And I also have some music that relates to my, my interests. So I, I really like drag. I always have when I was a child, I guess. I have this real focus on equity and social justice. Even as a child, my favourite movie was Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which is not really an appropriate movie for a young child. But 
uh, is all about celebrating difference and and talent and being who you are and who you want to be. And um, so I've always loved drag and uh, RuPaul's Drag Race is a favourite TV show of mine. And I've got a whole playlist of RuPaul's Drag Race lip syncs um, and RuPaul's music and, and lots of other drag queen releasing, you know, they've released lots of music and songs and and it's amazing because it gets me thinking about those things, you know, equity, uh, justice, people, self-expression, people being themselves, people celebrating the talent. Yeah, so much. It's it's so all-encompassing music. I think it's it, it opens up like this world of never-ending possibility for me. And and does it also helps me align with my body, my mood, my emotion, everything. Mm, great point about this the social justice dimension. I've always wondered why did a young kid in year six from Mount Gambia get into political hip hop. Like I really got into public enemy back in the day when I was in primary school. What appealed to me about that kind of music and all of the music that I've liked since has been underground. It's music from the edge. Mm-hmm. It's associated with different kinds of social movements. And so why, you know, it's not just the, the music itself that appealed, but I think there was something about the minority experience of the people that were making that music and the cultures that they were coming from that appealed to me, and I didn't quite realise why, and now I do, there was something yeah. in those people's experiences and in, and in the experience, the life experiences that those, music, those musical styles were embodying that resonated with what I was feeling as someone who was different. Yes, and I wonder too if it has something to do with um, neurodivergent people not really just recognising or understanding conformity and the social order and the way things are done for the sake of done in the world. We mentioned before we kind of see patterns and systems and get frustrated by politics and some things that run in society. And I wonder if it's because we don't just conform, not to say that non-neurodivergent people immediately conform to things and don't have critical thinking, absolutely not. But I wonder if it is something to do with just thinking differently, experiencing the world in a different way to lots of other people yeah, picking up on other minority um, groups and issues and social justice issues and also just looking at systems and, and thinking that system doesn't make sense. Why are people listening to that system and challenging it and definitely getting some pushback but still feeling this sense of, yeah, just resonating with the, the nonconformists and the, the edge dwellers? Exactly, exactly. Edge Dwellers Cafe. I've been looking forward to having that music discussion with Beck for months. This question about why I'm into the music that I'm into is something that's intrigued me for many years, so it was great to be able to explore this with someone with expertise. See the show notes for Beck's contacts and details about her research, along with links for some of the articles that we mentioned in our discussion. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast, please do click on the like or subscribe buttons on whatever platform you're listening on. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also support the podcast financially with a one-off PayPal contribution or by subscribing as an Edge Dwellers Cafe member on Patreon. That's a wrap. This is Ben Habib signing off from the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Stay safe and much love.